From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Yes, it's David Spark with Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review. Bank of America Insider charged with money laundering for BEC scams. Rough seas for the U.S. Navy this week. Microsoft Report details the changing cybercrime landscape. These are just some of the stories that we have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Christopher Zell, who is a CISO over at Wendy's. Christopher, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, David. Spicy nugs for life. Try or do fries. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Our sponsor for this very episode and all week with the cybersecurity headlines is BitSight. More from BitSight later in the show. Also tell you that if you're watching us live right now or want to hear us live, you can join us on Crowdcast, uh, crowdcast.io slash CISO series, where you can find us. If you're seeing the video on like uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn, or on YouTube, just head over there. That's where the conversation's happening. We have just 20 minutes. Let's jump into this. Now, our first story we did not mention right up front, but it is a doozy because it just came in. Missouri governor threatens legal action over HTML. Now, Missouri Governor Mike Parson is threatening legal action against a reporter and newspaper that found and disclosed a security vulnerability that left educational staff's social security numbers exposed and accessible. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch reports that it notified the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that one of its tools was returning HTML pages that contained employees' social security numbers, potentially putting the information of over 100,000 employees at risk. Now, despite the fact that the outlet waited until the tool was taken down by the state to publish its story, the reporter has been called a, quote, hacker by Governor Parson, who says he'll be getting the county prosecutor investigators involved. Chris, shouldn't this governor actually be saying thank you or turning to his CISO for guidance? Uh, yes, I, I I think he's trying to challenge Dutch Swartz to the best bad idea award. Um, and and I will actually challenge that. And I will say, let's just stop selling keyboards with the F12 button uh, and problem solved. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like lean on your, lean on your specialists, lean on your CISO, lean on your CIO of the state, and they will set you in the right path. This is not hacking. This is, uh, this is more helpful than anything else. So yeah. Yes, and and just to the references that Chris just made, Dutch Schwartz is an attendee to our Friday video chat where we play the best bad idea, and he usually he has won many times. Good. I think holds the title for most wins. And the F twelve key pretty much just shows your HTML code, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's it's open for everyone to see. And in fact, reuse of HTML code is widespread and has been for for years and years and years. So yeah, this is just an example of not knowing what's going on, getting afraid of it, and trying to whack it over the head with a stick. So. For those of you in the chat room right now, please feel free to make any comments on any of these stories and we'll include them into the show as well. Next story, Bank of America insider charged with money laundering for BEC scams. Now, the accused is one of a gang of three who infiltrated the corporate networks of small and large companies in the United States and beyond. They access email servers and email accounts by phishing employee credentials and via malware. Sounds like a common story we've heard. Now, one was a Bank of America and TD Bank employee. The three spent months intercepting communications and getting to learn about billing systems, style of communication, vendors, clients, and people responsible for transactions. In order to send requests for payment, that mirrored real transactions. They made off with, get ready for this, a total of $1.1 million dollars. Chris, the key part of this story, I would think, is their time and care they put into their social engineering efforts. It seems pretty extensive. Now, this is not the kind of activity that sets off easily a tripwire alarm. How do you see this kind of behavior early on? Yeah, so I think there's there's two things. You talked about the the, the haul, you know, how much they made. I mean, the, the return on investment should probably be fairly equal to the time that they spent, you know, planning this. And it sound, sounded pretty good. But, you know. So, yeah, I, it sounds like they made a good ROI on this. Yeah, one. but, you know, my question is the way the article is written in the headline, like, 
were these folks actually using Bank of America or TD Ameritrade systems internally to do this uh, activity? Or is it just like they were doing this at home and they happen to be working for the banks? Those are, those are two different situations. The, the article never mentions that. Because if this is activity that they were conducting on internal kind of banking systems, yeah, there are some things that, of course, this is low and slow, but there's some pretty advanced, you know, behavioral entity uh, user analytics software that can pick up on anomalous behaviors and language and tone changes in emails. But the headline might be a little bit misleading because we don't know were they actually using their bank systems at the time or are they just employees that work for them. So it's a little bit, a little bit leaves it, you know, open ended in my mind. I, well, I would assume if they're already employees, they're pulling some of that information from inside. I yes, would that's right. You know, if if they are using the knowledge that they've gleaned from, you know, their actual positions, that that is one thing. But again, if they're taking that home and, and launching their scams and malware and phishing and all that social engineering from home, what can you really do from a corporate perspective? So it's, it's interesting because the article kind of leaves some of that left out. Next story, Medtronic recalls insulin pump controllers over cyber attack risks. Now, the company describes these as severe vulnerabilities that could lead to injury or death of the patients since an attacker could modify the quantity of insulin that the pumps provide to the patient. The urgent medical device recall applies to the Minimed brand remote controller, which uses a wireless radio frequency to communicate with the insulin pump. The company pointed out that to date, it has not received reports of any injuries resulting from this issue. Chris, this is what we call now a killware story. And the weakling in the chain does not seem to be the insulin pump, but it's remote control. How hard is it to stay continually aware of these kind of hidden weak links? Yeah, I mean, there's an entire ecosystem that's built around medical device security. And, you know, I, I think this is part of a bigger well, issue. I, I would also say not enough medical device security. No, that's absolutely right. Because look, you know, Medtronic, um, not to point them out, but they also make other devices like defibrillators and pacemakers and, and things like that. And we've known about these issues for years. Uh, it was 2007 when um, oh, Dick Cheney, uh, his doctor actually disabled the wireless, the RF uh, connectivity on his pacemaker because they feared an, uh, you know, an attack from a remote uh, threat actor. So, you know, I, I don't know what the uh, vulnerability reporting criteria um, is within the medical device field. I would hope and assume, and I and I'm very close to some people, and I have very firsthand knowledge of folks that are like kind of Iron Man type you know, biomech folks, and they rely on these devices. And um, so I hope that those reporting standards are very stringent and that the uh, requirements to bake security in uh, is also very stringent. But look, I mean, these are human beings still that are programming these things. And as long as you have good human beings trying to fix these things, you're going to have less than good human beings trying to continually break these things. So yeah, it's, it's definitely needs some attention out there. Navy Warship's Facebook page hacked to stream Age of Empires game. The official Facebook page of a destroyer-class Navy warship, the USS Kidd, was taken over by someone who wanted to stream the online multiplayer strategy game Age of Empires and did so for an entire day between October 3rd and 4th. Facebook is used by the U.S. military as an official communication channel, particularly for family readiness group. Experts state that many Official pages are managed using a shared login, and as a result, multi-factor authentication, or MFA, is not enabled. Chris, you are a veteran. I'm intrigued by the use of Facebook as a tool for family communication as opposed to something more proprietary. And the big elephant in the room here is why MFA here has not been enabled. I would imagine that would have been an immediate necessity on both ends of the pipeline for the sailors on board as well as family homes. Your comments... Yeah, I mean, David, have you heard the term uh, military-grade security? Um, <laughs> yes. Those of us who have spent time in the military, that's a bit of an eye roll for us. Yes. But, you know, look, the, the Navy admitted in their statement that their official Facebook page was hacked. They used the word hacked. But was it really hacked? Or or did the threat actor just log in using properly shared credentials? And to your point, um, the, the lack of MFA. Um, and look, I love Age of Empires. It used to be a big you know, new, gamer. The new one's coming so out I, in I just a few it. weeks, actually. I'm I'm looking forward to it, you know, and but I do I think you're right. The bigger issue is the military has been using uh, social media platforms for many years um, as a means of communicating with family members and things like that. I've not been a huge fan of it. I mean, I'm probably 10 years ago when the commander of I believe it was U.S. European Command 
um, had um, a copycat uh, LinkedIn profile set up, same picture, same image, same everything. And they were actually adding um, connections of other high level DOD um, uh, senior leaders. And um, so that's something that we need to pay a lot of attention to. And, and you know, you'd think you'd, you'd think you would pay attention to things like shared credentials and, and MFA. Um, yeah, so it's it's not something that is probably any different than other organizations, retail organizations, marketing companies that also heavily leverage social media, but it needs to be part of their uh, incident response thought process, just like anything else. I just also want to comment that John G. or Gallagher, actually, at Viacu, uh, made a comment on our insulin pump story and referred to it as the internet of deadly things, which sort of adds to that killware motif we were talking IODT. about. DT. Yeah. Uh, yep. Next story. Microsoft report details the changing cybercrime landscape. Its second annual Microsoft Digital Defense Report, based on trillions of security signals, details the rise of ransomware as a service operations with consumers, financial, and manufacturing sectors the most commonly targeted. The company also saw an increase in phishing emails between June 2020 and June 2021, with a large spike in November. Now, in malware, Microsoft saw an increase in web shell base exploits as well. So Chris, what are your observations about this? Most notably, the sort of large spike in November. I'm gonna guess it's because of sort of holiday shopping season. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, we we, we absolutely see that come and go. We, we see a lot of these attacks come come in waves and a lot of times they do correlate with holidays. They correlate with things like, uh, you know, tax, tax preparation time, things like that. But, you know, I, I agree. Uh, with these changes or not these changes but you know kind of the spikes in these areas and and so with the cyber insurance companies if you if you talk to them um and you know it kind of talked about the return on investment earlier and it's there for the threat actors i mean we're talking about ransomware malicious emails and other malware uh the barrier to entry to conduct these types of operations have probably never been as low as they are right now. And you mentioned ransomware as a service, right? I mean, you you don't need to have the technical knowledge to do these things anymore. You just pay someone for it, right? And, and I'll say, look, as as the email defenses get better and they're great products out there, um, we're building a better mousetrap and the mice are getting smarter. And it's gonna continue to be that that game of, of kind of one upsmanship until something drastic happens in the future. I, I don't know what that drastic measure is yet probably something along the lines of of, of ai and, and blockchain and quantum computing but we're not we're not there yet it's it's going to be tough until then by the way i just saw this coming in from the register uh, a company called virus total has noted that 95 percent of ransomware targets windows machines that's a doozy well now uh let's hear a little word from our sponsor bitsight you know, these are challenging times from, for security professionals. I don't need to tell the security professionals who are listening about that, but from managing third-party supply chain risk to quantifying financial exposure to reducing the likelihood of ransomware, BitSight helps security and risk professionals create more effective cybersecurity programs with cybersecurity ratings and analytics. Now, learn why Moody's, the Department of Defense, and other leading institutions partner with BitSight. You can learn by heading over to their site, which is bitsight.com. And that's spelled B-I-T-S-I-G-H-T.com. You got nuclear secrets in my peanut butter. This story was everywhere just because it's, well, it sounds like a fun, bad spy novel. A Navy nuclear engineer and his wife were arrested for attempting to sell nuclear warship data to what they believed to be an agent of a foreign power, but in reality was an FBI agent. The dead drop was coordinated using encrypted proton mail email in exchange for Monero cryptocurrency. Now, the SD card of information was actually hidden in half of a peanut butter sandwich. Eventually, three dead drops were made in total in exchange for $70,000 in cryptocurrency. Chris, so this is not quite Tom Clancy material, and I'm not sure either why it was important to identify the type of sandwich you used, but you know, we would not have had that title if we didn't. But regardless, is this the physical nature of this crime indicative of better cybersecurity overall, or has this always been going on and has similarities to our Bank of America social engineering stories and being less cyber and more human? Yeah, let I me mean, two two things real quick to start off. The first one, I think, you know, why people think they can still get away with this kind of stuff just blows my mind. Um, number two, I love peanut butter. I'm well. I, let me let me pause <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah. 
they get away with it for the first couple of times and then they think they're never going to get caught. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, yeah, and, it's like, like a good hustler lets people win the first couple of games. Yeah, that's they true. They're, they're, they're giving lose. them a little bit of a tease, a little bit of a taste. Right. And, um, right. and you know, the second part I said, you know, I love peanut butter. I'm a little offended that, you know, now peanut butter has been implicated in this. They, they should have checked, you know, used something terrible like mayonnaise. Um, but, but here's the thing, like <laughs> who wants to eat a mayonnaise that's right. sandwich? This, this is nothing new. Right. And as long as security clearances has been around, um, unsavory people, malicious people have been around much, much, much longer. Right. And that's the risk that we take with people. Um, and the government does as good as it, you know, job as it can with the, with kind of the security clearance process. Um, so, so I get that, but you know, to your point, the fact that they had to resort to this kind of physical cloak and dagger kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I would say, you know, passing this same type of information and communications on what's probably the highly classified and highly protected systems that this information originated from would probably either get you caught very quickly or just wouldn't work at all. I've, I've worked in top secret facilities and, you know, basically nothing gets in and out anymore um, without someone knowing or, or finding out pretty quickly. So, um, yeah, but again, I mean, everyone going through this indoctrination process, even, even just, something as small as an SD card. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've been in facilities where hot glue go, or hot glue is used to fill up the USB and SD ports, for example. All of the peripherals are, are wired serial. There's no Bluetooth. There's no, you know, wireless connectivities. So, um, yeah, why why they think they can still get away with it is, is just kind of beyond me. All right. Biden signed School Cybersecurity Act into law. Cybersecurity experts hailed the K-12 through Cybersecurity Act this week after President Biden signed it into law last Friday. The law, which became one of the rare bills to pass in both the House and Senate, instructs CISA to examine threats facing the nation's schools and provide cybersecurity recommendations and toolkits. These are in response to ransomware attacks and incidents that leak sensitive data from students and staff, which has been happening with remote learning. Now, one CTO noted that while the bill was, you know, designed to increase security awareness and guidance, quote, most districts lack the ability of managing digital identities, which is the cornerstone of a strong cybersecurity posture today. Chris, what's your take on the observation and what could be done to help schools manage digital identities better? Yeah, I mean, look, I think this is a, an extraordinarily ambitious undertaking, and I and I appreciate um, very much the CISA and DHS and everything that they're that they're attempting to do. Um, but look, I mean, we've got senior level Pentagon cyber and technology officials walking out of the office because you know we can't get uh, the 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 race in hand with China when we're talking about things like cyber and artificial intelligence, healthcare industry, manufacturing. I mean, we're all facing these issues. And we haven't gotten it right yet, even at the federal government level. So it's it's great that they're trying to raise awareness to these issues. And and again, the article even mentioned, you know, this that away awareness is the easy part. How we get things done, that's going to be difficult. Um, we've moved several times over the past few years, and our kind of now 16 year old, um, we've seen uh, schools that use technology very well, and we have uh, seen others that don't use it at all. So I think there's a disparity between, you know, funding for school districts, state, county, federal level, and I just don't know how they're going to apply the same level of, you know, kind of support across the board. I really hope that they do, um, but it's going to it's going to be tough. So tough is, I would say, the understatement. Well, let's hear a story about a student who did well or we believe so possibly <laughs> we'll, we'll see what you, I, uh, I want to know what you think, Chris student used a zero day for school prank. Now last April, Illinois teenager Min Duong and a group of friends took control over all network displays inside their high school district playing Rick Astley's never going to give you up during a recess period, a classic Rick rolling. Now, Min published a step-by-step -step guide on how he did this, which started by analyzing log files for the security cameras in the school dating back to 2017. He eventually discovered two novel privilege escalation vulnerabilities in Externity IPTV products that allowed him to gain access. Min contacted the company to report them, but he never heard back and said they were still present in late 2020 updates to its software. He also filed a full report on how the attack was done with the school's IT staff. Chris, does this kid deserve to be punished or hired? Yeah, I, I want to talk to him. That kind of that 
that's what sets the tone for me. No, look, you know, it, it seemed like everything ended well for him and, and the school had a bit of a sense of humor uh, for it. And, that, and that's great. And um, and the fact that he kind of provided this very meticulous write up, you know, shows, you know, kind of not only his creativity, but his his ability to kind of apply some maturity to what he's doing. Yeah, he didn't ask for permission. And but should he be punished? Mm, you know, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think it seems like he's learned that you want to use your powers for good and, and not evil. And, you know, it wasn't anything damaging, but I, you know, I think the bigger issue that he called out, look, he contacted the vendor, didn't hear anything back. That is yeah. not uncommon. That is not uncommon. Um, but, you know, I think his curiosity will serve him well going forward. Um, as long as he asks for permission um, to do this type of stuff going forward. So, but you know, what I like about this story is that yes, he so did the sort of, ethical disclosure process like he should mm -hmm, mm -hmm. did not hear back it was there for years and this was a way to get recognition to get press and you know i'm assuming get the problem solved in a very public mocking way that brings a little humor and lighthearted attitude to something that could have been pretty bad and it ended up not being so yeah, and he said he worked years on on you know searching this vulnerability and validating it and verifying it. So I'm sure there was some pride you know associated with it as well. So, all right. Well, so uh, some closing out today's episode. I, I want to ask you, Chris, any thumbs up or eye roller stories here? Which which one's your favorite on either way? I, I'm I'm thumbs up on 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 the kid with the zero days. Uh, I, you know, I was thinking about it, and I, I've got a 20 year old who who works part time in IT, and and had he done something like that in school, um, you know, I would have been probably a little proud, and I would still probably call him a knucklehead for for doing it. Um, if he got suspended for a day or two, I probably wouldn't you know fight it. But um, in in the back of my back of my mind, I'd be like, yeah, that was, that was pretty cool. Good job. You know, it's so kind I'd of a badge thumbs of up honor, on that I one. think. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there was no malicious intent, right? It could have been way worse. So I would call him knucklehead, but Hey, pat him on the back at the same time. By the way, as an added personal story, my son is obsessed with Rick Astley and is actually dressing up as him for Halloween. I love it. I love it. Christopher Zell, CISO of Wendy's. Where can people find you? Uh, check me out on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active. Love to connect with others and um, help out where I can. So, yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Chris. I want to thank uh, our producer. I want to thank uh, Steve Prentice, the producer of this uh, headline show, and he's a regular reporter as well. And I want to thank our sponsor, BitSight, for being a phenomenal sponsor of the CISO series. Again, more on them at bitsight.com. Now, you can come back next week for our Friday video chat. Uh, we do one every morning, so literally, like, it ends an hour and a half before this starts. And next Friday is going to be Hacking Ransomware, an hour of critical thinking of how to combat a really hard-to-stop attack. It starts at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, and then we have this really fun meetup immediately afterwards. And then you can listen to this Week in Review show. It starts 90 minutes after that um, on Friday at 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Now, remember, you can also always tune into cybersecurity headlines every single day. It's just six minutes of eight of the most important stories in cybersecurity news. You can just find it on whatever podcast app you're listening to, or just go to CISOseries.com, and you can find a way to subscribe to it there. Until then, I'm David Spark reporting for the CISO Series. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.